morning, Village. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Or good afternoon, Village, I should say. Uh, praise the Lord. I am excited to be before you uh, this Sunday as well as I am blessed. We are into our final, final Sunday of February, Black History Month 2021. And I hope the excitement and the motivation about everything we have seen here this month, uh, we take with us throughout the year. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read for those who were not here, um, our scripture reading that was read before by our deacon. Um, it is Luke chapter eight, but I'm gonna read starting at verse 22 and go down to verse 25. Again, that is Luke chapter eight, verse 22, starting at 22, and I'm gonna read down to verse 25, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. One day, he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let's go to the other side of the lake. So they put out, 23, and while they were sailing, he fell asleep. The wind stormed, swept down on the lake, and the boat was filling with water, and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? They were afraid and amazed. And they said to one another, who then is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. Let us bow our heads in prayer, church. God, I just wanna thank you for this service so far. God, I wanna thank you for how each and every Sunday you meet us in these worship services and you and you just elevate our praise. You just show how you have been working in the lives of each and every person here. And it is nothing but excitement and praise and thanksgiving. God, I wanna thank you that as I go into the sermon, God, I ask that you remove me. Lord, I ask that you still even the storm within me of anxiety, God, and you let your word come out to your people. God, I ask that you bless everyone that is here. Lord, bless their hearts, bless their ears as they prepare to hear a word from you. God, I just thank you and I praise you. And I'm just every time after time humbled by this opportunity. God, I just ask you to be with me and your, and your people in this time in worship in your name. Amen. So a little over... 20 years ago, almost 21 years ago, Scott and I saw a movie. And although um, this movie is considered one of my favorites, if it's on TV, I would definitely sit down and watch it. It is also an ending that each and every time I see it, I feel sad about the ending. The movie is called A Perfect Storm. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. It stars George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. And the movie is about a crew aboard the Andrea Gale who set out to sea in search of a big fishing haul. They were successful in that fishing haul. But on the way back, they landed themselves right in the middle of a perfect storm. They were trapped in the middle of not one, not two, but three fierce storms that merged together and was thought of at that time as the storm of the century. The movie depicts the efforts of the crew led by their experienced captain, paid by George Clooney, to get out of the waves of this storm. They were trying to get on the other side of the storm. Sadly, after doing all they could in this storm, the storm was just too powerful for them. They encounter a wave toward the end. It capsized the boat. The boat took, off, took on water 
and the entire crew was lost at sea. What even saddens me more about this movie is at the end, they show the real live crew members that the actors played at the end. And then it also makes me sad because then I'm able to connect this situation to very real people who were out at sea and lost at sea in a storm. I remember sitting there stunned. These are lives lost. These are families forever changed. Families mourning just because of this storm. And although, and although they were fishermen who sailed under the direction of their captain, in the end, they were unable to overcome the perfect storm. So in today's passage, we see a similar story about a storm at sea. The title of this passage in our Bibles usually says um, Jesus calming the storm or some other version of this. This story is told in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But today we will look at it from the perspective of the Gospel of Luke. Like the story of the perfect storm, this is a crew at sea, not under the direction of an actor playing George Clooney, but under the direction of Jesus. And Jesus had a mission in mind when they set sail. The mission was, let's go across to the other side of the lake. Jesus had a planned destination for that vessel. The storm that came was not anticipated by the disciples. The storm then descends upon their path and the storm brings a fierce impact of wind and waves. It brings them a threat that they're going to lose their lives. And verse 24 tells us that they cried out, and they said, Master, Master, we are going to drown. The crew contained fishermen, just like the movie, The Perfect Storm. But instead of seeing their way through the storm and fighting their way through the storm, they decided they were going to drown. They believed that this storm had the power and the strength to overtake them. The scripture states that they woke up Jesus with this firm declaration, we're going to drown. Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves. And then he poses them a question, where is your faith? Jesus's actions then causes them to ask themselves a question, who is this man? As believers, I think we can see that we too, over the last year and throughout our lives, have experienced some stormy days, some stormy nights, some stormy weeks, some stormy years, and sometimes it just seems longer like it's just a stormy season. And when life's events come at you just out of nowhere, you, we don't expect them. But in our storms today, our storms today does not find us at sea on a boat. See, our storms today find us at home waiting to hear that our loved one has been discharged from the hospital, but instead we hear they're no longer with us. Our storms today come in the form of my loved one has caught COVID. Will they survive? Our storms today come in the frustration and the anger of having to navigate an unfair and an unsupportive work environment. Our storms today come in the waiting room where we are waiting for the doctor to return with the test results. Our storms today show up when we have more bills than money in our bank account. Our storm today descends upon us in the loneliness of quarantine and social isolation when we can't reach out and talk to and touch and hug another brother and sister in Christ 
and get encouragement. That's where our storms show up today. But unlike in the movie, The Perfect Storm, in our storms and in the passage today that we see, we have an eye in the storm. Our eye in the storm is our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And because He's our eye in the storm, we don't take on the perfect storm because we have the one who's perfect in the storm. So the title of today's sermon is not the perfect storm, but Jesus, he's perfect in the storm. Say it to you again, not the perfect storm, but in our storm, we have Jesus, he's perfect in the storm. Throughout the month of January and February, we have been taken somewhat of a voyage, I would say, of getting to know Jesus in a more personal way. We have been in the gospel of John and we have been getting to see Jesus through his I am sayings. Today's passage is the first one in the last two months, if you haven't noticed, that we went to the book of Luke. But although this passage finds us in a different book, the purpose is still the same. This passage is designed to show us who Jesus is and who he can be in our storms as well as when the waters are clear and moving calmly. So as we close out this sermon series with today's sermon, I want us to focus on a question that has been asked for the last four Sundays in our sermon series. Jesus knows everything about you. How much do you know about him? It's been read every Sunday by a clergy member. Jesus knows everything about us. How much do you know about him? And in order to help you answer that question, I'm going to give you three points today that I want to help you answer that question. And my first point today in using the story of Jesus calming the storm is that we must recall the words written in the word. We must recall the words written in the word. See, because to know Jesus personally, you got to get in the word. Why do I say that? Because 1 John 14 tells us that the word became flesh and lived among us. The word who Jesus is, and it depicts for us what he has done for us as God who stepped into his creation as flesh and took on the sins of the world in order to reconnect us back to the Father. So that's why you got to know the word, because in the word, we know Jesus. And so the word then becomes our anchor in the storm that stabilizes us. The word is our guide when we're blinded by the storm. We see in Luke chapter eight, verse 22, the reason why it is imperative that we know the word. Jesus said in 22, if you pay attention, he's, his words were, let us cross to the other side of the lake. Under God's word, the disciples set out and during the journey, this unexpected circumstance comes. Something that they didn't plan for shows up in their lives. And the disciples saw the unexpected. They saw the wind, they saw the waves, and they did not remember the words that were spoken to them. Instead, they replaced the words of Let's cross to the other side of the lake with the words, we're going to drown. They mean two different things. Jesus said, let's, 
That's an inclusive word that everyone that's in this boat is going with me to the other side. The wind, the waves started blowing. They started rocking. The boat took on water and they replaced his words with, we're going to drown. In the face of the anticipated challenges and the drastic shift of events, they did not recall the words that was given to them. Because if they had, they would have realized because Jesus said, we're going to the other side. This storm doesn't hold the power to drown me and overtake me. Because Jesus said, I am going to the other side. So although I don't see it, although I don't know how, although I don't know if I'm going to get there floating on a rice raft or swimming for my life, I am going to the other side. This storm that has descended upon me today will not prevail in taking my life because Jesus said, I am going to the other side. So when we find ourselves stuck in a storm church, what do we recall? Do we recall God's word that's been given to us that reassures us we're gonna to get to the other side, even if we can't see it at this moment because of the storm? Or is our, our ability to endure the storms in our lives in order, excuse me, to endure the storms in our lives, we have to recall God's word that's been spoken to us. In these times, we gotta embrace the good news found in Jesus Christ. Embracing the good news has to take precedence over Fox News, MSNBC News, and the breaking news found on our local news challenge. That has to be on the forefront and not taking over what God has said to us as individuals and said to us as his church. God's word is filled with many promises and blessings. These words can calm our hearts, even in the midst of our storms. One such example is found in Romans 8, 37, when it says, no, in these things, we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. Embracing the word is embracing God in the middle of the storm. Embracing the word is understanding that even in this storm, God is holding me and comforting me. Embracing the word brings you from far out mentally, physically, and spiritually, and draws you back closer to God in the midst of your struggle and in the midst of your storm. When we recall the word, it places us in a better position to understand what's going on. So my second point is we have to recognize who's with us in the storm. In order to answer the question, how much we know about him, we have to recognize who's with us in the storm. The disciples fearing that they were going to drown say to Jesus, master, master, we're going to drown. Their recognition of who was with them in the storm was blurred by the fear, the winds and the waves. The storm in the stormy conditions, the disciples had lost sight of the eye in the storm. They had forgotten who was laying in the storm with them. Church, let me clarify this statement. With Jesus, we have an eye in the storm. In the world, the eye in the storm is the EYE. I'm here to tell you today that our eye in the storm is the I, the I am. 
our eye in the storm is what we've been going through in the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the truth, the life, and um, the truth, the way, the way, the truth, and the light. I am the true vine. Jesus, the I am, that is our eye in the storm. We have an eye in the storm. If you go back to the book of Exodus, when Moses says to God, who should I tell them sent me? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is our eye in the storm. When you walk with the eye in the storm, the I am, you are never alone. And we got to recognize who Jesus said he is through his I am statement. So they get to the eye of the storm and they wake Jesus up in the wind and the waves and he rebukes the wind and the waves of the storm. Jesus speaks to the wind and the wave and they were calmed. But a beauty of it is that Jesus also speaks to the real danger that was on that boat. It was not the wind and the waves. The danger that was on that boat was that fear and that clouded lack of faith. That was the danger that was going to drown them on that boat. And so Jesus woke up and he spoke to the storm that was outside of that boat, but then he spoke to the storm that was brewing inside of those disciples. And I'm asking us today that when we feel that storm brewing on the inside of us, that we need to do what Jesus did and we need to speak to that storm that's speaking on the inside of us. And we need to remember that he is the I am. He is the eye of the storm. He is the eye that I don't care if his physical body slept. He is the eye that remains on us. He is the eye that don't miss a beat. He is the eye that there's no storm that can depend, that can descend upon his people without him first waving it in. He is our eye in the, recognize that we have an eye in the storm. So church, I believe that our storms can be a powerful lesson. We must know Jesus and we must recognize him as the eye in the storm and that he is with us and we must remain faithful to him no matter the circumstance. Even when we don't understand the storm or even when we are in the midst of the storm and we don't know what to pray for, get at the eye in the storm. Jesus remains perfect in the storm and he is also perfecting in the storm. Jesus is working us through and working us out even in these storms that come upon our lives. And when we put out our SOS calls in prayer, we must not be filled with fear. We need to begin to take on some faith and we need to call out in faith, recognizing that Jesus watches us in the storm. And he sits on the right hand of the father who transcends each and every storm, each and every hurt, each and every disappointment, each and every attack from the enemy, each and every abuse. He transcends and he can speak to it in our lives. We do not need to have the answers. We need to believe. We need to believe in what? Who Jesus is our eye in the storm. And when we do not know what to pray for because the storm has taken over us, Romans, Romans tell us in 8, 26 and 27, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. The spirit helps us when we are in the storm. And for when we don't know what to pray, the spirit intercedes on our behalf 
with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the spirit, the knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes on the saints according to his will. So even when you are in the midst of the storm and you don't know what to pray for, you just cry out. And God will, the spirit of God in you will do the rest to God the Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. After Jesus rebukes the storm and the seas calm, the disciples were better able to recognize who this is with them in the storm. Jesus was able to reveal to them the God that sent him and the God that he is. He was able to show God's power and authority. And see, while they were on that boat with him, they didn't have the benefit of this New Testament that we read today. But what they could recall, going back to recalling God's word, is that they could recall Psalms 104 that spoke to the God who created the earth. And in Psalms 104, there's a verse seven that says, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. And at the sound of your thunder, they took flight. They saw that in the storm in Jesus. And they could also recall a Psalm 107, which speaks of God's deliverance. And in Psalms 107, there's a verse 29 that says, he stilled the storm to a whisper and the waves of the sea were hushed. So they saw the words written there executed in the middle of the storm in Jesus Christ. Don't you doubt that you can't see Jesus. You can't see God move in the midst of your storm. Jesus brought a greater recognition to them. And we have the same voice, the same authority, the same power that is activated through our faith. This power is with us in our storms. And to rec if you think about it, when we recognize someone, it is because we are now better able to identify this person or this thing that maybe we didn't fully see until we recognized it. So now we can see in these storms, the power of God. We can see the character of God. We can see the faithfulness of God. And we can see the promises of God to get us to the other side. Storms help us recognize. We don't like them, but they help us to recognize some things. It helps us to recognize our need for Jesus. And it reminds us that his spirit is always with us. And through his spirit, he is perfect in the storm. In the storm, his love God's love for us is revealed and his gracious gift of salvation is revealed. God gave us a perfect gift. Let us not fail to recognize its presence and its value, even in the midst of the storm. My last point, church, I wanna talk about is the recovery of the storm. See, because when we get through the storm, we got to remember that there was purpose on the other side of the storm. See, God doesn't do anything for no reason. God doesn't send us anywhere for no reason. So you've made it through the storm. You've made it to the other side just as God's word said. Now let's focus on why are we on the other side? Luke 8 tells us, if you go further down from today's reading, that the vessel arrives on the other side and they arrive in a region called the Gerasenes. This was a Gentile region. This was not 
um, where they had left, where there were people that Israel, this is now a Gentile re, uh, region, people who don't know God. And on the other side, we see in verse 27 that we find a man who's also in the midst of a personal storm. In verse 27, we find a man who's not at sea, but he's in a storm. We find a man who's possessed by demons. He's being overtaken by being possessed by demons. Verse 27, we find a man who has no clothes and he didn't have a house to live in. We find a man that has been quarantined, isolated and kept to the tombs, to the cemetery. And he's isolated and kept away from others because of what he's going through, because of what he's experienced. He's been stripped down naked and now he is without a home. And Jesus steps off the boat and it soon become apparent the reason for the other side. Jesus steps out of the boat and he brings the good news of physical healing and spiritual healing to the man on the other side. But bigger than this one man church, I want us to understand is that he brought the gospel, he brought the good news into a region that did not have an expectation of a savior. They did not know Jesus. They did not know what they were missing in their lives because they, they didn't have it. And he's bringing to them what they're in need of. And he's starting with one man that he greets in a cemetery. Jesus frees this man from bondage. He calms the storm that was raging within this man. And he frees him from his own personal storm. When the people of the town and the region arrive, it shows that a transformation because of Jesus making it to the other side, because of that vessel making it through the storm, we find that in that time, transformation had occurred. Verse 35 says that the demons were gone and he was sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. Church, I'm gonna say it again. When it started out, he was naked. He was without a home. He was without clothes. He was um, overtaken by demons and he was living in a cemetery. Jesus steps off that vessel. Jesus brings the good news. He brings healing, spiritual and physical. And he is sitting at the feet of Jesus and he is clothed and in his right mind. Church, let's talk about the other side. Regardless of the difficulty we might find ourselves in today, we gotta push through, we gotta press on, we gotta endure because God has a purpose on the other side. I don't know what it is when I sit here today, but I tell you, God has a purpose on the other side. On the other side, is our opportunity to show love. On the other side is our opportunity to show compassion. On the other side is our opportunity to bring the good news. On the other side is our opportunity to bring the eye in the storm, to set people free. On the other side is our ability to clothe those who had no clothing. Church, do you hear what I'm saying? God has a purpose for the other side of the storm. If you had let the storm overtake you, there would be no other side. If you had turned around and went home, there would be no other side. If the disciples can call on Jesus in the midst of the storm to rebuke the winds and the waves, would there have been another side? I still believe they would have gotten there because Jesus was on that boat and he had a purpose. But church, I need us to understand our calling on Jesus and believing on Jesus executes our purpose for the other side. So this Sunday, the last Sunday of Black History Month 2021, we are part of this unique, distinctive body called the church. And we had the pleasure, people were able to join and see the slideshow. We were able to see how God has been able 
to bring this church through the many storms and the many challenges and the many things that got in its way, the early persecution of the church, the faith of a people in times of slavery, the faith of people during time of segregation and Jim Crow, the faith of a people during church bombings and killings, the faith of a people through lynchings, the faith of a people through the Emmanuel 9, when nine people were killed in Bible study in South Carolina, the faith of a people has brought us to the other side today where village community church can sit and worship and give God for thanks for the other side. We as a body, God has brought us through the other side of the storm and church, we gotta believe. Whatever storm is in our lives today, God got another side waiting for us. Until we draw our last breath, there's another side to this storm and God is taking us there in the other side. Each and every person represented here has faced some storms in their lives and in the last year. I encourage you all this week, as you go out, as you set sail into the world, masked up, instead of focusing on the storms in your lives, I encourage you to focus on Jesus Christ, who is the I in the storm. I ask you to answer that question for yourself personally. How well do you know him? And I need you to remember that he is perfect before the storm. He is perfect in the storm and he is the perfect savior on the other side of the storm. I need us to recall his words. I am with you always, even till the end of time. I need you to recognize when he says, I am. I, and he says that all authority is in heaven and on earth has been placed in him. And I need you that when you recover from the storm, seek your purpose on the other side. Seek out the person who's waiting for the good news on the other side, the person who is trapped in a storm, the person who is living in darkness. And I need you on the other side to bring the light, to set them free, and to remember our forerunners who came before us and has bought this church on the other side of race, uh, on, on Jim Crow, on the other side of bombings, on the other side of lynching. Church, we got a responsibility and we got another side to cross over to. So I close with this. Jesus, he is not the perfect storm, but he is perfect in the storm. How well do you know him? Thank you, church.